you don't have to be super excited about everything all the time. It is okay that sometimes your PhD is just a job. Try to build in pieces that you get excited about. You may know her from this beautiful Instagram page as PhD Balance. That's right. Today we have Susanna Harris as our guest. Welcome back to PhD Coffee Time. This is the online community for you as PhD student to get motivation, peer support, and practical tips during your PhD. I am thrilled to have Susanna Harris with us. She's going to share with us a few tips on how to resume motivation when you are in that. Pit of despair of your PhD. I think it's one of those things. It's something I get asked a lot now that I've finished up my PhD. Is how do I, if I'm in a PhD, if I'm in grad school, and I don't feel motivated, how do I get motivated? How do I get back to that feeling of when I started grad school, of just like wanting to do this, excited about whatever work I'm doing. Now I'm not excited about anything. What can I do? So I'm excited to talk about it. So, what would be the few practical things that a PhD student could try if they lose motivation? Take a little bit of time. Invest time in yourself to try to figure out what is going on. Understanding where these feelings are coming from are that's going to allow you to figure out what kind of solution might be the best. Figure out what exactly you're feeling, when you're feeling it, and why you're feeling it. Are you always feeling? Unmotivated? Are you always feeling like you're not excited? Things that used to make you feel happy, you don't care. That can be actually called anhedonia. It's a really strong indicator for uh, being depressed or dealing with depression. You can be unmotivated. You can be dealing with a mental health struggle, and you can also be in a position of having both of those things. So, not to say that anytime you're feeling unmotivated, it's a sign of mental illness. Absolutely not. Those things happen to everybody. All the time, but first you want to check in and say, is this specific to what I'm doing, or is this sort of like a general? I'm just not feeling things right now. So let's say you kind of cross that out. You say it's I don't think it's a necessarily a mental health issue, or I want to focus on other pieces right now in addition to that. Then I would say, is it something that you're worried about? You're not motivated to do part of your work. Or is it all of your work? Or is it certain interactions? Sometimes you might feel totally unmotivated,、uh, for instance, to do like laboratory work. You don't want to go to the bench, and any time you get there, you're just sluggish. You don't want to go there. You put it off. But you might not be minding writing, or you might not mind talking or presenting, something like that, or or vice versa. Or maybe you say, "Oh, I'm really unmotivated to go into a space." But I don't mind doing the work. It's just like the human interaction. So knowing what those things are can help you mitigate what you're feeling. I think understanding that gives you those keys to say, "Oh, I'm feeling unmotivated to work at the bench." I bring up the bench because I just I liked grad school, working at the bench early on, and by the end, it was something that I kind of dreaded. And I started to actually build in more opportunities to give presentations because presentations motivated me to do the bench work. So that would be my first piece of advice: is once you have an idea in what cases you're unmotivated, try to use other things as motivators. You don't have to be super excited about everything all the time. It is okay that sometimes your PhD is just a job. Try to build in pieces that you get excited about.、Uh, the next thing would be. Find other, just outside opportunities to do something that you're excited about. Getting to enjoy things and getting to be excited about science communication, for example, even some, you know, if you're science writing or if you're just journaling for yourself, maybe you're leading tours or you're just going for walks in the woods. It might be something that helps your career path. It might be something that you don't think will affect your career path. Everything you're doing, you are a whole person, and so. Finding motivation in other pieces, finding things that naturally you're just excited about, can help carry those feelings into other things that you're doing. I think the last piece of advice is to go back and really question that idea of how are you feeling when you first started grad school? Like you were probably very excited, very motivated, but you might have also felt very anxious. You might have also had a lot of doubts and fears, and maybe you're still dealing with that, of course. But I think sometimes we. Glorify our experience of grad school at the start, and then look at it and say, "Oh, it's it's terrible here in the middle, and it 
it is terrible in the middle, but I would just say like, don't get hard on yourself that you are no longer the perfect happy scientist or happy grad student, um, because that just might not be a, a reality. It's totally okay to just do the work and not necessarily be 100% excited about it all the time. For me, doing science communication and outreach through a local planetarium got me re excited about my work. Like I got to think about my work in different ways and in the ways that I used to think about it mm. of like, wow, look at what science can do instead of by three years into grad school, I was like, look at what science can't do. Look what I can't do as a scientist. Can I do anything as a scientist? And then you talk to sixth graders and they're like, oh my gosh, a microscope. And you're like, yeah, this is really cool. My job is really cool. So many of the skills that I learned while doing that stuff, it's now contributed to what I want to do with my life and, and part of my career. So I, I'm not a huge fan of when people are like, just take a break. I think it's great. It's something that's necessary. It's something that is incredibly uncomfortable for me. I do not enjoy it. Not everyone can take weeks off, but mm -hmm. I do think that everyone maybe has an extra five or 10 minutes in their day that they're doing something that might stress them out, might be unproductive. I certainly have times where I'm like, I had no time today and then realized that I spent two hours on Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. If you can give yourself some space, give yourself some space. If you're not at a place to do that, that's okay. You don't have to feel guilty on top of every single thing else you're doing. I really like that approach. One thing I learned from working out in the gym is you take rotation with muscle group. And I think your approach is very similar. Like you may be tired of lab work, then you do some writing, but you may be tired of reading and writing. Then you go to do some data, make some figures. Like you, you always can do something and mm -hmm. you put them back together and that will be the pieces for your PhD. I love that. I have <laughs> never heard that analogy. And I wish that more people would say that because it's absolutely true. Yeah. If you try to go have an hour long workout, that's just yeah. working your biceps, yeah, exactly. like you're not going to get that much out of it yeah. versus yeah if you mix it up you're going to get this whole body workout and my last really big piece on this is that I, I wish there was a less cliche way of saying it but like the idea that like a phd is a marathon not a sprint i don't know if it's even a marathon it just goes on forever like at <laughs> least a marathon you know where it's going to end it's just you're you're just like walking through the wilderness and so just to have that in mind that it is not a sprint. It's not even necessarily a marathon. It's just this process that you're trying to progress through and to realize that a single day of sprinting, sometimes it's necessary, but in the grand scheme of things like sprinting and then crashing out is not sustainable and it's not efficient and effective. If you get out of your PhD, just hating everything, but you did it a year faster. I don't know that that's better. So I would just say like, keep it in mind that I feel like so much of my PhD, I felt like if I mess this one thing up, the last four years are gone. Or if I mess this up, I'm going to be a week behind and then everyone's going to be upset with me. And it's like, everyone knows that science doesn't work. They might be upset with me, but that's not my fault. And just say, Hey, is it reasonable what I'm asking myself to do? It's so good. I started tracking my every hour during postdoc because my salary was too low to qualify for unlimited time working. So yeah. we had to report a working hour to the HR. Oh, wow. and, and because I didn't want to lie and I do have a lot of work to do. So back then I started tracking my hour every day and I was so stubborn to like try to prove them wrong that I need more than 40 hours a week. Yeah. But the 40 hours a week was sufficient and I was exhausted by the end of it. But given I didn't track the lunchtime and breaks, like, you know, if you look at the day, if it is like a 10 hour, nine hour work days, you probably can carve in like eight, seven hour, very intensive work. And then towards the end, you are not very productive. Right. So I use Toggle, which is like a free app online. And I just uh, type in the task and then I press the play button and I track all the project, all the tasks. Oh, toggle. Yeah. I use that too. That's right. part of how I finish my dissertation. Yeah. And like when I did a bunch of freelance stuff, that's what I would do. And it's also, it's exactly what you said, where yeah. it's like, sometimes it's nice because you look at it and say, wow, I did a lot this week. And other times it's nice because you're like, I'm working really hard, 
but I'm not working 70 hours a week. Like I, right, right. it's okay. It, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it's sometimes it's psychological, like you felt like you were exhausted from overwork, but then when the number comes in, you will be like, maybe I should be more patient and also be more aware of how I feel after how many hours of work. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest issues when people talk about, well, if you really want to be a good PhD student, you need to plan on 60 hours a week minimum. And I'm like, well, you're not getting a PhD in math, apparently, because if you actually calculated this out right. over, right. if you average 70 hours a week, right. average, and you assume any time is taken off, like I want anyone with a PhD to sit down and do that math of what that looks like and tell me that yeah. anyone does that. Both of us are from life sciences. A lot of time, the assumption is that the longer time you dwell in the lab, the more good data you could possibly generate because life sciences takes time. You need to babysit the plants. You need to babysit the cells in the lab. And it's not really a highly intelligent task. As a smart PhD, we need to control using our intelligence more instead of letting the chore and the long hour carry ourselves away. Yeah. Go back to the workout analogy, but like kind of a sprint workout where yeah. sometimes you have to use your brain really hard and it's super taxing. You can't do that for eight hours a day. You can maybe do it sometimes, like I definitely had eight hour days where it was like right. I needed to be thinking all day long, yeah. but I couldn't do that every single day of the week. Mm -hmm. So it'd be nice if I could set up my day. So half of it was thinking and the other half was essentially like PhD arts and crafts. We've all done that, especially in right. life sciences. Yeah. Where you're like, I'm going to cut holes in paper for the next hour and a half. <laughs> exactly. Um, and if you can mix those together, it's perfect. If you can just kind of like think really hard and then take a break, listen to a podcast. My ideal day would be early morning writing and then like 10 o'clock lab work until like post lunch lab work. And then maybe afternoon mentoring students, maybe meetings and stuff, repetitive work. And then in yeah. the end of the day, I can go to the gym and just finish off with my physical, yeah. <laughs> like my brain has nothing left and I can like exhaust my body as well. And then I get really good sleep at night. It took me embarrassingly long to be in good terms with what I need and how I function. Yeah. yeah. No, it's so hard. And actually, you're probably hearing in the background uh, sounds of my dogs, which which were another big piece of, of kind of my motivation and my balance. One, in terms of motivation, there were plenty of times where, I, especially at my end of my PhD, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to write. And in my head, I would say, I have to feed my dogs. I literally, I have to keep this job so I can put food on I guess the floor, uh, but up into the bowls for my dogs, you know, so that was good. And then also in terms of what you're saying with like taking care of yourself, it was really important to, I had to take care of them. You know, a big part of my job was making sure they had food and water and sleep and everything they needed. And so it was a lot easier to take care of them sometimes than it was to take care of myself, but I could kind of use that as this is an excuse for why I have to go home and I can't be in the lab for 14 hours a day. It's amazing. I have the same situation with my cats. Yeah. <laughs> I can't just go home to Hong Kong because like, I can't just fly and just give up and go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I have one video before about depression as postdoc because I did get through a little bit of problem when I was postdoc. I was in a workshop that talks about peer support system. It talks about how we should be more self-aware of our needs in terms of what are the support system we wanted to build around our academic environment because research is very tunnel vision. You may have one PI, maybe a few lab mates or maybe no lab mate for some people. So the workshop taught us to identify what are your academic mentor, professional mentor. They could be two different people and then identify what are these physical outlets, like if you go to the gym, the emotional, social, spiritual, cultural and then safe space. I don't even know where that list comes from because the graduate school dean has given us the exercise sheet and we were all writing that for five minutes. In the end, some students actually cry after like realize maybe they need to fill out some of the space. Like some people may have a spiritual need because they change country, they never get to 
go to the same temple or it seems like there's no replacement but then but if you think intentionally maybe they are maybe there are like tiny cultural groups that you can join in the area so i'd like to see what's your thought about this type of approach or do you have a similar way that we can have a practical tips for this type of support community building yeah i i think that's it's it's so interesting to hear you talk about that because i think when i suggest to people of taking time to sit down and understand how they're feeling and understand why they might not be feeling motivated. I think a lot of times people think I'm talking about sit down for a week, you know, take a, take a huge break from your life and do that. You can actually have these moments. If you set aside 10 minutes, you know, check in on how I'm feeling or see if my needs are being met or just Googling these or Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think when we talk about needs in grad school, we just talk about what is considered the bottom few layers of Maslow's hierarchy of literal, what do you need to exist as a mammal essentially <laughs> that you, you need to, you need to have shelter. You need to have food. You need to have water. Um, you need to have safety emotionally and physically. Okay. Those are, those are needs. And I think usually we say, well, I, I have most of my needs met, but Maslow's hierarchy includes other things of feeling like you have esteem from yourself and others feeling like you have the potential and the opportunities to grow yourself to what's called self-actualization, figure out who you are and, and work to the best of your abilities. You need to feel a sense of love and belonging. And so the key is to surround yourself with people, to build that community, to build that network of support. I think if 2020 taught us anything, it's the fact that we don't know where we can get support all the time. And so if we have multiple people to lean on, even if some others are having a hard time at the same moment, we still have support. So looking at your needs, thinking about your individual needs, thinking about where you might not be fulfilling those, how can you surround yourself with people who will understand you, who will help you fulfill those needs, who will help you rethink your life and will challenge you to be the best version of yourself. And is in the best version, I mean, what you consider to be the best version. The best version of me, in my opinion, looks very different than the best version of someone else in their opinion, and probably looks different than the best version of me in their opinion. So I would say find the people around you who want you to be fulfilled, want to see your needs fulfilled and are willing to put in effort to help you make that happen. That's a big part of actually why I created the group PhD Balance was to build that community of people who understood each other's challenges and who were just willing to put time, effort, and empathy into helping other people get through grad school. This is the perfect sec way for me to ask you more about PhD Balance. If there is a student watching this video who has never met you, never heard of PhD Balance, how should they start using the resource? Yeah, absolutely. So the quick backstory is that PhD Balance originally started as PH depression um, in as in it was an Instagram page that was in March of 2018 in the end of my fourth year of my PhD. And it started because I read an article talking about how a super high percentage of graduate students, like up to 40% were dealing with anxiety or depression. And that was kind of startling to me, but also very comforting because I felt like, oh, it's not even just that I could tell somebody and they'd say, oh, I feel really bad for you. I could tell a lot of people and they'd say, oh, same here, me too. Mm -hmm right now, today. And so I just wanted that to be more of a conversation and I wanted to start putting faces to those stories. And so it started as an Instagram page just to show people who were dealing with depression during a PhD. And very quickly, a lot of other people came forward and said, hey, I wanna share my story, but I'm dealing with anxiety or I'm dealing uh, with schizophrenia or I'm dealing with an abusive advisor. I wanna, like people wanted to share their real stories that they had a hard time with, that they didn't feel like they could necessarily share with their cohort. They wanted to share it with others who it might help. So it grew, uh, changed the name to PhD Balance to hopefully encompass a lot more of this. 
And we now have a team of about 20 volunteers all over the world. What our mission is, is to create spaces for graduate students to learn through shared experiences. So people can share what they've dealt with. They can provide advice. People can ask questions. They can say, hey, this is what I'm going through. We have a website, which is where we are building a repository of resources. We are on social media. It's PhD underscore balance. The website is phdbalance.com. So you can see a lot of discussions. We hold a lot of live discussions. We actually try to create as much of a community atmosphere as possible uh, using both a Discord server, allowing people to chat with each other. And then there's like virtual coffee hours, virtual work togethers. And yeah, you can just get involved there. We have a weekend grad chat hosted by Faye Lin, who is absolutely fantastic. But I would say if you want to get involved, if you want to learn from others, just check out the website. Uh, it'll give you an idea of what all is there. Um, you're very invited to just be uh, an observer, just go in and read these stories from people, look around. If you want to interact, if you want to share your story, all of it is just really fantastic. It's absolutely the most fulfilling thing that I did in my PhD because of all the fantastic people I got to meet. It's a ton of academics, both during their PhD and after. A lot of people are just there to support other PhDs who obviously they're they're brilliant, they're motivated, they're fantastic, they're academics, but they're also the, the genre of academics who really, really care about other people and really want to see other people succeed. I will put the links to your website below for those who has the first time come to get to know Susanna. I hope you will check out not only her website, also the two other podcasts she has with Papa PhD. It was wonderful journey that she has shared. We're getting to the end of this interview, Susanna. But first of all, thank you so much for sharing the practical tips and also this welcoming community. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned volunteering is one way of getting yourself out of the lack of motivation. So I hope this is a call to action to you guys. If you are watching and you're watching to the end of this video and you really enjoy the sharing of Susanna and you like what she does to PhD students, don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm sure she would love to expand more than 20 volunteers all over the world to help all of us, each other as a community of PhD students. Because I think 40% of depression rate is something we should act on as a community to help each other. There's nobody else externally that would care more than us. It's really an honor to have you today. I know this is a longer video for you guys, but I hope this will be a, the right resources. When someone search on Google, when they have a crisis, they will see Susanna and they will feel everything is better and everything is okay. That was so sweet. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to my channel and I will see you the next time. We may have Susanna back, so comment below if you want her back. <laughs> I, I want you back already, so. <laughs> I'm not very good at closing. Uh, oh, this is so hard. <laughs> yeah, because it's just, you don't have to close with yourself, right? You're like, okay, I'm I done. Know. <laughs> I know.